follow there. This may look familiar. I sat on a similar rock just a couple of weeks ago in a video titled There's Silver and Them There Hills. I think it was a rock just further up the hill a wee bit there. And the thing about these views is they, they, they always change, you know, it, depending on what the weather's like, it's, it always looks different, completely different. The, uh, the gorse or the broom, and I still don't know the difference between the two, um, has gone and uh, the Ockle Hills no longer have that vibrant yellow colour about them. But it all looks just as beautiful, just in a slightly different way. And it's an interesting day for clouds. I think for anybody who perhaps does a bit of photography or painting or just loves the great outdoors, uh, the clouds are wonderful. I, I love clouds. And today we've got an interesting day for them. It's very hot. Although I'm starting to feel a little bit cool now because my shirt's wet and it's cooling me down very quickly. But yeah, it's a hot day. I think it's probably, a, I, I would guess that it's over 20 just now. And the, the forecast is, is for it to be just cloudy with low winds. But I have seen some clouds that have a hint of uh, iffiness about them. Clouds that could, with a bit of persuasion, drop a lot of rain. <laughs> Even a wee bit of thunder, in fact. Just coming out of Glasgow this morning and there were some really threatening looking clouds uh, that were trying to form into Mamatus clouds, that shapes. They hadn't quite done that, but you could tell by the just the look of them that they were trying to form oh, partially, if not wholly, into mamatis clouds. These ones that kind of hang down. So, given the heat, you know there is uh, the potential for thunder. And when you're out in a hill, you've got to be very careful if there's thunder around. I was talking to a guy in a bus there, and he's gone out for a walk as well. He's just, um, he's gone up Ben Cluch, which is the highest hill in the Ockle Hills. And <clears throat> just in talking briefly to him, I, I, I knew that he knew the score as far as being out walking in the countryside is concerned. And we talked briefly about thunder. Uh, you know, the last thing you want when there's thunder around us to be standing upright almost beckoning you the thunder to transfer itself to ground via you you don't want that now, I remember walking somewhere I, susp I think it was near Lauder many many years ago possibly on the southern upland way and there was thunder nearby, you could hear it rumbling, it was close at hand. And as I was walking, I was conscious of the fact that I was constantly looking out for little dips or hollows in the ground that, if need be, I could go and lie down in. You know, it's all about just having a lot of common sense. And th there doesn't seem to be many people these days who have common sense. Is that something you can get taught at school, common sense? Or is it something that's inherent in your genes? Inherent, rather, in your genes? I don't know. You can teach people skills. I'm not sure if common sense is a skill or an inherent trait. The reason I'm here is that in the last video that I did, the silver and them there hills, there was something that I spotted that um, has made me want to come back here. I've had a few videos like this where I've felt the need to come back because something I spotted something and I've kind of thought about it and I thought, I need to go back there. 
This particular thing, I actually shot footage of it in the last video, but I didn't use that footage. One, because I already had enough footage, I didn't want the video to be too long. And also, it was pretty crap footage. It's one of these bits of video where I wasn't quite in the shot. I, think I, I mean, most of me was in the shot, but occasionally an arm or a shoulder would sneak out of the shot, and it just all looked a bit naff. So I thought, even if I a space to use it, I don't think I could have used it. Um, so today I, I want to have a look at that uh, thing and I want to measure it. Um, the Silver Mines and Silver Glen is just behind the camera. The feature that I wish to measure and talk about is right there. I'm not sure if the camera is low enough to pick it up, but um, let me just show you what I'm talking about here. Okay, so th this is what I, I I want to show you and what I wanted to have a proper look at and take measurements and such like. Um, I'm struggling to find a good position for the camera to kind of show it all to be honest because most of this is actually at ground level and not that easy to see. Um, what we have here right beside the bending track leading towards up the, the side of the Nebet Hill is a row of structures all joined together. One row of buildings uh, comprising of four, either four rooms or four structures all joined together to form one, as I say, row. And as I say, I spotted it the last time I was here. Um, and I, I did have a look at Google's satellite or Earth view and you can clearly see it on that. In fact, it's probably more distinct on that than it is on the ground. Uh, now, the thing is, it's not shown on Ordnance Survey maps. The earliest Ordnance Survey map, dating to probably the 1850s at the first edition, it's not shown on that. Uh, generally, Ordnance Survey will show you uh, buildings even when they're ruins, and the fact that it's not shown on the first edition Ordnance Survey map suggests to me that by the middle of the 19th century, this wasn't even a ruin. It was just perhaps, as it looks now, all at ground level and pretty indistinct. And it was clear to me as soon as I saw it that this is a row of, of buildings. And they're not exactly all the same size, which is why I've got a tape measure with me. I want to start uh, taking measurements and things and perhaps creating a plan. Uh, because somewhere at the back of my mind I'm thinking, perhaps an archaeological dig needs to take place here. And I'll tell you why. Behind the camera is Silver Glen, where there was a number of silver mines. Uh, silver was mined in two different phases, in the early 18th century and in the middle of the 18th century. And as I previously said in the last uh, video, uh, there was a lot of silver came out of the, uh, those mines uh, during the first phase of mining. And uh, a lot of that was used to fund the 1715 Jacobite Rising, as led by the Earl of Mar. I don't think they got just so much in the second phase. What I think this row of structures is, well, I, I think it is somehow related to, to the silver mines. And I, I mean, there's a lot of guesswork here. You have to kind of form some sort of hypothesis in order to kind of progress and then take it from there. But I think this is a mixture of living quarters, storage, and perhaps even stabling for a couple of horses that would allow the miners who were uh, digging these silver mines to get to and from wherever. That's what I think. Um, you know, we're talking structures. I, 
I would be guessing, I think they're probably built in the early 18th century for the first phase of mining and probably reused during that second phase. And as I say, most of this stone is at ground level and the odd bit of stone that you can see that is perhaps, well, that is still in situ and kind of together with other stones is not shaped in any way. It's very rough stone. And I don't know whether the walls of these structures would have been stone or would, unlikely I think, uh, or tough. But I just given it such, it's quite a, it's quite a long roll. I, I, my gut feeling is that these were stone structures. Don't know what they would have been roofed with. Thatch maybe, not sure. So now I just want to take some measurements and uh, let's create a plan and uh, take it from there. that measuring has made me a bit peckish. I'd be glad when we don't have to wear a mask anymore. They're already talking about it down in England. I'm fed up wearing a mask and having my glasses steam up. I suspect like everybody else, if, if I crewed a small collection of masks and the ones that I find the best are the kind of blue and white sort of NHS ones you might say and, and they are the best because uh, they're big enough. All the other masks that I've got are too wee. If you put them on they, they make your ears stick out and if there's one thing this pandemic's going to, if there's one effect it's going to have in the population, is that it's going to probably give rise to a generation of folk with sticky out ears. And some of the other masks I've got, I've got a, like a, a Hulk mask. It's got a green with a big set of teeth on it. And, um, I, did, I bought a packet of three masks once, very poor masks, I don't know why I bought them other than the fact they were probably cheap. I thought three masks, that'll do for me. I think it, the, the different colours as well, there's I think a black one, a blue one and a red one. But it's very, very poor, it's like one thin sort of cotton layer of material, but it's just really up to the job. And I only, I don't think I've actually worn them, because as soon as I got them home and looked at them I thought, Nah, <laughs> I'm not going to wear them. Uh, 
the, the material has a sort of feel of underpants about it. Well, it's like putting a pair of underpants in your face. I thought, I don't know where that, you know. And I half thought it might be funny to take them back to the shop that I bought them in and say, it's about these underpants and I, I just found them to be a wee bit on the small side and I wondered if you had anything a bit bigger. <laughs> yeah. That's just what happens when you get old, you develop a rather strange sense of humour. What we got here, Baines. It's a roll with ham, egg and tomato. I'm going to eat this. Of all the things I've been thinking about lately, apart from what to measure next, um, I've been thinking about pedestrian crossings. As you well know, I, I, come, I stay in Partick in Glasgow, and frequently I'll be standing at a pedestrian crossing and somebody will come up and press the button. These are people who have lived their whole life, and some of them are quite old, and yet they still haven't fathomed out that when the light, when, when, when the light that says wait is illuminated, that means that somebody has pressed the button, and there is therefore no need to press the button again. And you get some people who I don't just press it once, I'll kind of do a little kind of series of presses as if that'll somehow upset the mechanism and uh, make it turn to uh, give you a green man quicker. I mean, what is wrong with these people? Did, did they live their life in a, some kind of weird parallel universe? When the button is pressed, the weight thing will light up. That's all you need to do. There's no need to press it again. Look, look at what's left of the walls here. This is very crude. I, I don't really see any dressed stone. Some of it looks as if it might be, but on the whole it's just not dressed at all. It's just big lumps of stone. Um, so that's the measurements taken, and I'll show you the plan that I've, I've made here. Um, my, my reason for doing all this and for coming back here is that, you know, whatever this is, and I do believe that it is a row used by the miners in the silver mines, used for accommodation, storage and perhaps stabling. I mean, it's not a castle, it's not a palace, it's not a building of huge importance. But the mining of silver in this area does have some significance and, and some importance uh, as far as Scottish history is concerned. As I previously said, um, I mean, there were huge, malleable lumps of sil silver uh, extracted from these mines in the early 18th century. And a good whack of that was used to fund the, the first, sorry, the 1715 Jacobite Rising, not the first one. 
Um, and so any building that might somehow be associated with those silver mines, I, I think is important. Uh, down at the sil one of the silver mines, there is a, an information panel and you can uh, look over a fence and see the entrance to one of the mines. And I believe that there should at the very least be some sort of archaeological dig in this row of structures to perhaps try and determine what they once were. And if, as I suspect they were, somehow related to the silver mines, then perhaps another plaque up here would uh, give people a bit of information about the whole thing. Um, I mean, you know, it, it can be very difficult digging in the buildings from large bits of stone, but, you know, you, you're going to find the odd little bit of pottery and just the, the odd little clue that, that will tell you what this was, whether it was lived in or whether it was just storage or what it was. Um, you know, it, it, there's plenty in Alva and in Clickmanninshire as a whole for visitors and tourists. I mean, you know, there's the local hills here, which is really all you need. You don't really need much else. <laughs> These are stunning just on their own. But the other little thing that you can add to perhaps uh, create a, a, oops, a, um, additional interests, it's got to be a good thing. Anyway, that's, uh, that's it. I, I think I'm probably going to head back. Um, rather than go back to Alva, I think I'll go... Uh, on to Tillacoutry, on what is called the Hillfoot's Diamond Jubilee Way. It's just a, a track or a trail that you can walk on. Uh, it runs between uh, Blair Logie and Muckert, uh, seemingly following, uh, in at least part of the way, uh, routes or a route that may have been taken by royals uh, between Stirling Castle and Falcon Palace. And it is uh, signposted, you can follow it quite easily. So I'll go back to Tiller Country that way. Um, take care guys, I'm Eddie Burns. <laughs>